was made a priest who was taken from the epistle of St. James. Beloved, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no change nor shadow of alteration. Of his own will he has begotten us by the word of truth, that we might be, as it were, the first fruits of his creatures. You know this, my beloved brethren, but let every man be swift to hear, but slow to speak and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not work the justice of God. Therefore, casting aside all uncleanness and abundance of malice, with meekness, receive the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. The Gospel. Today's Gospel is taken from the Gospel of St. John. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, I am going to him who sent me, and no one of you asked me, Where art thou going? But because I have spoken to you these things, sadness has filled your heart. But I speak the truth to you. It is expedient for you that I depart. For if I do not go, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of justice and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of justice, because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. And of judgment because the prince of this world has already been judged. Many things yet I have to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will teach you all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he will hear, he will speak, and the things that are to come he will declare to you. He will glorify me, because he will receive of what is mine and declare it to you. Thus far as today's Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. The season, Easter season is fast approaching its end when we will celebrate the ascension of our Lord into heaven. And he is in today's Gospel preparing his disciples for that departure. And when he tells them, I'm going to leave you, Sadness fills their heart. And he says, why don't you ask me where I'm going? You're just sad because you, I tell you I'm leaving. And many of these things, just as he says in today, the end of today's gospel, many of these things you don't understand because you do not yet have the Spirit. These things are hidden from you. And we see that even during our Lord's public ministry. Many things he spoke and the people even the apostles did not understand the word that he spoke. It was hidden from them. And I believe the reason so many of these things are hidden from us, hidden from the apostles, hidden from people in general, is because we do not lift our thoughts, our hearts, higher than the material realm. We have these physical things that we are attached to. And history is replete with examples of us making gods out of material things. We want a God that we can see, that we can feel, touch, and hear. And God, to accommodate us, sent his only begotten Son. Here, you want flesh and blood, you want something physical, I will give you my only begotten Son. Here he is. But even our Lord, the very presence of God himself in human flesh becomes an obstacle to us. Because God is trying to lift us from this world into heaven. And we are trying to bring God from heaven down to this world. We are trying to take the spirit and make it material. And our Lord is trying to tell us we need to elevate the material and make it spiritual. It was necessary that Christ should leave the apostles. And though their hearts are filled with sorrow and they don't understand why, it is necessary. And it is only after they receive the Spirit that these things are made clear to them. And I suggest that we are in the same realm as the apostles. We tend to make a God of what we can see and touch, our material things. We tend to bring God down to our level. 
We even read the sacred scriptures with a materialistic point of view. As I often criticize the Protestant idea of what is it, uh, success, the gospel of success. You see, if you're successful, then God has blessed you. I've got a different name for that. But prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel, yes. If you are prosperous, that means that God loves you. And if you're failing, that means that God doesn't like you. You're not pleasing to God. And that is the farthest thing from the truth. Those whom God loves were the outcast. Those whom Christ came to save were the poor, were the sinners, were the weak, the just, the righteous, the wealthy. You don't want me, you don't need me, I didn't come for you. And so it is not a gospel of prosperity, but a gospel of poverty. And I think our Lord made it abundantly clear. You want to be my disciple. Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily. Come, follow me. Leave your attachment to all the worldly things. Leave your attachment to money, property, whatever. Leave all that and come, follow me. And you will find rest for your soul. And I know we're at kind of a dilemma here because our bodies are good. The material things are good. All these things God has made, they are all good. But it is a matter of hierarchy, a matter of importance. The highest thing is God, the soul, the spirit. And way down at the bottom are all these material things. And our body is somewhere in between. And the philosophers say this body of ours, uh, this personhood of ours, is a microcosm, a miniature world. And they look to all the creation around us and they see within the human being the mineral content that we see is in the soil that we dig up. We have we are composed of the minerals. We see the vegetative state as we see in the trees and the plants. We find that within us. We find the animal state within us. We even find the angelic state within us because we have a soul. Within us is all of God's creation. We are the crowning glory of his creation. Yes, the angels are a little bit above us, but the Son of God did not become an angel. He became human with us. But he came, became human with us to teach us that we must lift our hearts, our minds up higher than the things of this earth. We need not worry about the things of the earth. And he is very explicit don't worry what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, where you're going to sleep. You have a Father in heaven who knows you need all these things. He will give you all these things. Those non-believers, they don't know that they have a God. They don't believe that they have a God. They can worry about what they're going to eat, what they're going to wear, where they're going to sleep. Because they don't know they have a Father in heaven watching over them. And so they have an excuse to worry. But you, you know you have a Father in heaven. Don't worry about those things. And Christ makes it explicit. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and its justice, and everything else will be given you besides. And so as the hearts of these apostles are saddened because Christ is saying, I'm leaving you, his departure is actually another lesson that he's teaching them. And sometimes the lessons are a little bit hard for us to swallow because we're still immature. And it's only after the fact that we look back and say, oh, now I get it, now I understand. It wasn't until the apostles went in the upper room and they prayed for another 10 days after our Lord had passed, not 
paradise, but ascended into heaven for ten days. They are sad. They are afraid. They're still afraid of the Jews. They are worried. What's going to happen to us? We've been abandoned. Our Lord said, stay here in Jerusalem. Stay here and pray until the Holy Ghost comes. But we've misunderstood him so many times. Is that really what he meant us to do? Are we really going to receive the Holy Ghost? What's it, what's it going to be like? And of course, it's not until after the Holy Ghost comes that they can breathe the sigh of relief. Now the Gospels, the Scriptures, are all laid bare. They understand clearly. Now they understand all that Christ has said and done. Now they understand how Christ himself, in his person, fulfilled all the prophecies of the Old Testament. It was the Holy Ghost who filled their minds. It was the Holy Ghost who filled their hearts. It was the Holy Ghost who took away their fear and gave them courage so that St. Peter can go out and say, you Jews, you crucified him, the Son of God, but he rose again from the dead. Don't panic. You want forgiveness? He's ready to give it to you. Just believe in him and be baptized. And without fear, this same St. Peter who denied our Lord three times on Holy Thursday into Good Friday, out of fear of what people will say, what people will think, out of fear of a maidservant who says, aren't you one of them? This same fearful man is fearful because he's only looking at the material things. He only sees it with his, our, the eyes of our fallen nature. I keep wanting to say with the natural perspective or our natural level, but it's actually our fallen nature. Our original nature is supernatural. That's what Adam and Eve had in the garden of paradise before they fell. They saw, they understood. The Holy Ghost has come to restore. But before we can receive the Holy Ghost, we have to feel that separation. We have to feel that loss. We have to experience that sadness. We all want the joy of our Lord's resurrection. We all want the joy of the Holy Ghost coming and filling our hearts and souls on Pentecost. But before we can get to that point, we have to follow Christ to Calvary. We have to be ready to turn our backs upon the world and in, truly embrace the cross, truly embrace Christ. And then we even have to feel that separation, if you will, I think almost everyone has in the spiritual life. If you live long enough, you will feel that isolation. St. John of the Cross called it the dark night of the soul. That abandonment where we cry out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Where is he? And we're reminded, he hasn't gone anywhere. He's still here. He's still with us. He's still present, even though we can't see him or experience him or feel his presence, he is here. And that abandonment, we have to go through. We have to experience so that we can truly embrace the resurrection, truly embrace the coming of the Holy Ghost, that we can truly experience the joys of heaven. So that separation comes for everyone. Whether we like it or not, ready or not, here it comes. All the things of this earth are all going to be left behind. It makes me think of a little 
post I saw many years ago on social media. You see the size of your grave. It's the same. Whether you live in a mansion, you're a millionaire, or you have all this, you still get that same amount of earth. Or if you're a pauper, you get a pauper's grave, it's the same amount. And you can take none of it with you. It doesn't matter. These things of the world ultimately are not important. Have to maybe put a caveat there because the young people hear that and say, well, then why should I work? And they develop. <laughs> uh, it's not important. I don't need it. You know, God will provide. And our Lord also says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. He has put us here in the flesh and he's given us these material things and he expects us to use them, to develop them, to cultivate them, to increase them. And to the young people with such an attitude, I would remind them to read the parable of the talents. Our Lord gives a parable where the master gives different amounts of talents to his servants, and he goes away, and he comes back. And each servant comes and gives the original talent that was entrusted to them, plus the increase, because they invested it, they developed it. But the last servant, he had one talent, and he took it and buried it in the ground. And he dug it up and he handed it to the master. Here, master, you gave me one talent and I will return one talent. I know you're a just man. You see, I didn't lose it. And the master calls him a wicked servant. No, our Lord gives us the material things. Our very life here, it is a talent that's been entrusted to us so that we can invest it, so that we can increase it, we can make it grow. It is not God's intent that we can sit by idly, wasting away the time, the talents, the gifts of these material things. He wants us to labor, and he wants us to put our heart and soul into our labor, but he wants us to sanctify this labor. He wants us to sanctify these things. And I think St. Paul tells us how to do this very simply. Whatever you do, do it for the love of God. You must go off to work. Work for the love of God. You must sleep. Sleep for the love of God. You must eat. Eat for the love of God. You have nothing to eat and you're hungry. You must fast. Then fast for the love of God. It's so simple. Everywhere you turn, everything you do, you can do it for the love of God. You can make an offering of it to God. And you can sanctify all these material things. You can enjoy them. You can use them as if you use them not. Invest in them. Develop them. Multiply them. Increase them to the best of your ability. But don't give your heart to them. Your heart belongs to God. That's what I think the Benedictines who said you, sh you should labor as if it all depends upon you. Put your heart and soul into your work, whatever it is you're doing. Do it for the love of God and put your heart into it. Give it your all because you're doing it for God. It's a gift to God. Work as if everything depends upon you, but then pray as if everything depends upon God. It is this mixture, ora et labora, work and prayer, prayer and work. And rather than having them side by side or at different times of the day, as I suggested, St. Paul says, pray without ceasing. Whatever you do, do it for the love of God. Make everything a prayer. What is it that God wants? It's very simple. Look around you. Examine your state of life. What is it that you have to do? When I was a novice in the seminary, we were told very clearly, you know, when the brother rings the bell at 4.30 in the morning, that's not the brother waking you up. Don't get angry at him. 
It's God calling you to get up. And when you realize that that bell ringing is God's voice calling you, get up. No matter how tired you feel, no matter how exhausted and how much you want to just roll over and go back to bed, God is calling. You're going to tell God, wait a minute. No. When the brother rings the bell, it's God calling you, get up. When you hear the bell ring and it's time for you to go to the chapel to pray, go. When it's time, the bell rings and it's time to eat, eat. But each time, it is God calling you to each of these activities. It is the voice of God. Answer that call. Not begrudgingly, not half-heartedly, but with all your heart and soul. And even if it hurts, put a smile on your face. Do it lovingly. I am doing this for the love of God. As tired as I am and as lazy as I feel, I will get up because I love God. And it is His will that I do this. And so in our studies, our work, whatever it is that we're called to do, we can do that for the love of God. And we use the things of this earth to do it. But simultaneously, we're taking these things and elevating them. We are sanctifying them. We are lifting up all the material things to the pure spirit. To God himself. And that makes our life worthwhile. That is the value of our life here on earth. Is to lift all things to Christ. To lift all things to God in heaven. To take the material and make it supernatural. To make it spiritual. And it is sad when we lose these material things only because our hearts are attached to them. When our hearts should be attached to God in heaven. And I'll leave you with the thought of St. Augustine in the first pages of his confessions. He says, Our hearts are restless, O Lord, until they rest in thee. We look for God in all of these things, but none of these things can satisfy the desire of our heart. Riches, not possessions, not people. Nothing in this world can fill that desire that God has put in our hearts except God. So seek first that kingdom of heaven, and everything else will be given us besides. Benedictio, the Lord is my peace. Amen. Spiritus Sancti, Descendit Super Vos, et non yet sent.